Hi everyone, I'm Jude Sutherland Kessler, author of She Loves You, Volume 3 in the John Lennon series. She Loves You and all of the books in the John Lennon series are very unique. Why? Because they're narrative histories. Now a narrative history reads just like a story or a novel, but it's documented, researched, and highly footnoted. In fact, there are 4,000 footnotes in this book. You're going to get the exact story of the life of John Lennon. This volume, Volume 3, takes you through the exciting years of Beatlemania and historically walks you through every single event that occurred in 1963 and 1964. Accurate, researched, detailed, but told to you just like a story. Let's find out what that's like by going back to the 7th of February, 1964, the day that the Beatles landed at John F. Kennedy Airport in New York for the very first time. Here we go. It was a brisk 1.20 p.m. at John F. Kennedy Airport as shivering reporters informed their elated audiences that Pan Am's Yankee Clipper 101 the Beatles plane had touched down. It was rolling its ponderous way towards the International Arrivals Building. Whipped into a frenzy by Capitol's publicity campaign and by the ebullient DJs at WABC, WINS, and WMCA, thousands of eager American girls let go. They unleashed the passion they had barely contained since early morning, some for hours and hours, all night long, jumping, waving, screaming, chanting, whistling, tossing their arms about, squealing in ecstasy, the Bobby Sox females threw themselves closer to the Beatles. Clutching his BEA travel bag in both hands, George Harrison followed two stewardesses outside the plane. He needn't have fretted about his hair. The wind tossed it and made a mockery of all quaffs. The Liverpool boy tried on an anemic smile and glanced back timidly in search of John. John was only a step behind, his tie atypically cinched, his black travel bag clutched tighter, and his cap fighting him in the wind. But for once, an extremely rare once, John wasn't thin-eyed or tight-jawed. He wasn't sardonic. He wasn't angry. He was laughing. John Lennon was exultant. His eyes roamed the unfathomable crowds, and John rejoiced. Paul exited into the bluster. His travel bag casually slung across his shoulder, his mouth open in startled delight. He hurried down the Pan Am staircase where John had stopped dead still, gaping at the thousands upon thousands of fans on the rooftop, inside the glass overlook, behind the chain link fence, everywhere. John grinned and waved and took it all in, amazed, dazed, incredulous. And Paul? Paul waved to the matting crowd. He coyly cocked his head to the side and beamed. Ringo, however, was less ebullient. He bowed his head and squinted against the wind and the tumult. Wearing Maureen's scarf, the drummer frowned at the onslaught of high-pitched shrieks. He edged beside Paul and looked around, bewildered. A news reporter on the ground began his much-anticipated live report. As far as I can tell, the Beatles are standing almost completely and utterly in shock. No one, and I mean no one, has ever seen or even remotely suspected anything like this before. It was true. The Beatles clustered together one last time, posing for Scottish photographer Harry Benson. But this time they didn't give their traditional grin at nothing because the boys had everything to smile about. With a wet tarmac, and a blowy afternoon in front of them, they saw only the flash of a million cameras, the arms of 4,000 girls, and the sturdy, stalwart bodies of New York's Irish policemen standing guard in the eye of the hurricane.